Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. You know, there's a, there's a risk as a woman. If you put on lipstick and then put on a mask, you may take off your mask and look like the Joker. So I have a little bit of nervousness sometimes when I jump up here and pull my mask off. I'm so glad that you're with us today. What a great day to celebrate baptisms and just be in worship together. If you're watching online, we're so glad that you're with us. Let us know you're there. Give us a comment. Say hello to one another online because you have community there too. So today we're going to be in our first story in the New Testament as we get into this next week of our Advent series called Messengers of Christmas. We'll be hearing from two different messengers of Christmas, the angel Gabriel and Zechariah this morning. But I want to start with a question. Be honest. On a scale of 1 to 10, how good are you at waiting? How often do you choose the option that makes you wait the longest? Say, so which one will take the longest? I'll take that one. This week, as I was planning and preparing, I was even thinking about those times in my head when I go, what's the quickest way to get this done? We don't often like to wait. This week, I was at the doctor's office, and I came across these slides. There's a couple of slides. Um, I don't know if you can read that, but it says, we're running a bit behind, so I'm going to take whichever of you screams in agony the loudest. Sometimes waiting feels like agony, doesn't it? Sometimes we're waiting with a hopeful anticipation, and sometimes we're waiting in a reality of pain, the thing that we're waiting on. This next one, um, if you die whilst waiting, I think this might be British, if you die whilst waiting to see the doctor, please cancel your appointment. <laughs> and you know that sign was prompted because of the Wonderful comments that waiting people might make, right? We're not always very good at waiting, and certainly not waiting patiently. So today, the title of our message is While You're Waiting. That's what we're going to be looking at as we walk through this scripture. Anne Voskamp wrote a devotional called The Greatest Gift. She said, the heart that makes time and space for him to come will be a glorious place, a place of sheer radiant defiance in the face of a world careening mad and stressed. Because each day of Advent, we will actively wait. We will wait knowing that the remaining, remaking of everything has already begun. We want to be a people who can focus on waiting with an expectation. We want to be a people who can be in a place of waiting and wait actively. And that is so much of what Advent is about. Last week I mentioned that Advent is a time when we fix all of our longings, all of our hope on Jesus. And today we want to think about how do we wait when we wait in relationship with God. So we're going to be moving forward from where we were in the book of Isaiah last week, approximately 700 years to the gospel of Luke. And Luke begins his gospel, and he's very clear about setting a context. He says in Luke 1, verse 1, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So he says right from verse 1 that his intention is to put these stories, to put the biography of Jesus. That's what this gospel is. It's a biography of Jesus. He wants to put these stories in the context of everything that the people of God have been promised, in the context of all the scriptures being fulfilled in Jesus. And he says, you know, he's historical. He's known as a historian. He's researched this. But at the same time, the story begins with a supernatural beginning. Because you know, church, that all the work of God is supernatural. Amen? These are things that can't happen in the natural realm. And so this is what we're going to read about today. In verse 5, it says, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But 
they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So right here, Luke places us with the history, the natural facts that we need to know about these two main characters, Zechariah and Elizabeth. He places them in time by mentioning who was king, and then he says basically who they are in the natural world. This is their natural identity in verse 5, their descendants in the lineage of Aaron, the priest. But then in verse 6, he shifts to the spiritual identity of these two people, the substance of who they are, the character that God sees. They're righteous and they're blameless. Made me stop and think this week, what if someone was writing about me? There's the natural facts of who I am. Not incredibly impressive. Then there's the spiritual identity, the substance of who I am, which I hope will be someone who desires to please God, to love him and love people, right? These are the things that create the context for God to go to work in verse seven, the circumstances. So friends, we have a natural identity. We have a spiritual identity, who we are in Christ and how he looks at us and how he relates to us. And that's just a setup for how God will work in our circumstances. And that's what we see in the story today. This is a setup for how God's gonna work in their lives. So, these, this couple, they're a parallel story to the people of God, right? This couple has waited their whole lives. They're old, it tells us, and childless. Not the first couple to be mentioned this way in Scripture. They're old beyond childbearing age and without a baby. The people of Israel have been waiting centuries for God to fulfill his promises. And in both cases, it seems like all hope is lost. Certainly in the 400 years since the end of the Old Testament to this gospel time, it seems like they're just waiting on God and people have become hopeless. But in both cases, we know that when we're waiting on the Lord, it's never too late to hope. When we're waiting on the Lord, it's never too late to hope. And so what we want to learn today, what we want to pay attention to today is what to do while we're waiting. And here's the main idea. Waiting patiently does not equal a waste of time. The way we wait in our daily lives, the way we wait in mundane things, usually one of the reasons why it causes us pain is because it feels like a waste of time, doesn't it? But waiting patiently does not equal a waste of time in our relationship with God, and that's what we want to see as the story goes on. So Luke says in verse 8, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So by this point in history, there are so many descendants of Aaron, there are so many priests that they're divided into these other groups, these divisions. And then within a division, they choose lots to see who's going to actually get to go into the holy place. And this is something that was basically a once in a lifetime, even for this priest, a once in a lifetime occurrence, the time that God has chosen to act. It says in verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. And this week, I just thought about us. What's our expectation? You know, Jesus has made a way. The scripture says he's torn the veil. He's made a way for us to go right to the mercy seat of God. We have access to God at any time to be in his presence through Jesus. We have this access to experience his presence at any moment. And then we have these special moments where we come together like worship or the time that you set aside to pray or read scripture or be in community with other people who know the Lord. And it just made me stop and think, do we ever expect to encounter him supernaturally? How would we respond? How do you respond? Do you respond in fear? Do you respond in awe? Do you respond with greater expectation? Or are you just skeptical that this would be the Lord? 
Zechariah was afraid. In verse 13, it says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. There's a message of what these Christmas stories mean. It's being tied into all of history. The Lord is breaking into human history in the flesh. It's coming. This is what the angel Gabriel wants Zechariah to know. And his own child is going to play a part in this story. The story of these two who have been waiting for so long is going to be swept up in the story of redemption that God has been working throughout all of human history and what he continues to work even as we wait for God to return again. And so here we see, first of all, two people. We've already heard about their spiritual substance, their character, what their identity is before God. They're righteous and blameless. Their hearts are prepared for the work of the Lord. And then we see that this baby, John, is going to be called to prepare the way for the Lord. And so one of the things that we want to remember while we're waiting, while you're waiting, is to make your heart ready for the work of the Lord. Sometimes there are greater things happening that God is working out, the bigger picture that we don't see. Sometimes there are things that God may want to do in our lives, but we don't yet have the character to bear it. And so we want to be a people who make our hearts ready for the work of the Lord. We want to turn back and be in alignment with him. He's referencing here this idea of turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children. It seems to be a reference to what the prophet Malachi spoke of. And when he did, he was talking about repentance. He was talking about soft hearts. He was talking about people who wanted to be in alignment with the will of God. And so, friends, if we want to see God work and receive the full blessing of that, if we're in a period of waiting, we want to be people who make our hearts ready for that work. Amen? In Psalm 5, verse 12, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. There's this idea that even while we're waiting, when we pursue righteousness, when we pursue life with God turned fully to him, that we get to experience the blessing of a covenant God, his favor, like a shield around us. So Luke continues the story. Zechariah, very naturally, in my opinion, this is a very natural question. He says, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs, but remained unable to speak. Very natural question, don't you think? How can I be sure this is actually going to happen because we're old and it hasn't happened through the whole course of our lives? And so this is one of those occasions where I think the way that we view God is often how we interpret God in the scripture and in our own lives. And so if you think that God is a harsh and punitive father, it's very likely that you see this whole encounter as a punishment for someone having a doubt. If you view God as a loving and gracious and patient father, what you see is the Lord actually answering his question, how can I be sure? He gives him a sign. And when he gives Zechariah the sign, guess what? Everybody else there gets the sign too. They realize that something has happened, that God is at work. They say he must have seen a vision. 
And so instead of seeing this as just a punitive because he did not believe, because we all have these places in our waiting, don't we? Especially when we're waiting for our heart's desire, especially when we're waiting for something that causes us pain, worry, anxiety, fear. We all have these places where we question, is God punishing something? And instead, what we want to be about, friends, while we're waiting, is we want to be people who celebrate the signs of the Lord's faithfulness. This is a sign, this experience of being mute. Some of you probably think in no way would this be a punishment at all. Some of you, some introverts, or maybe those of you who have had to answer 1,000 questions a day with your kids home for months, right? Some of you feel like maybe this would be really great to be quiet for a while. But many people have read this scripture and seen it as a punishment, and instead, let's see it as a sign of the Lord's faithfulness, that he is at work, right? Just the way the people outside the temple realize God's at work. They don't know the fullness of that. They don't know all that it means, but they can see God's at work. And we want to be people who notice and make it known what God is doing when God is at work. It's an encouragement to everyone who's waiting. It's an encouragement to one another. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. What a great job title from the Lord. He was known as the weeping prophet because he lived in the midst of destruction and devastation and grief, captivity. And even Jeremiah said, while he was waiting for the Lord to move and to act the 70 years that it would take, while he was waiting and grieving, it says in Lamentations 3, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in the Lord. His mercies are new every morning. And so, church, when you're in a difficult place of waiting or even a good anticipatory place of waiting, don't fail to notice those mercies of God the faithfulness of God, the signs that he's still with you and he's still at work. He always loves you. He never leaves you or forsakes you. These are the things that we want to celebrate as signs of God's faithfulness, even while we wait. So Luke tells us in verse 23, when his time of service was completed, he returned home after his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. So one of the things that you notice in the Gospel of Luke is how he likes to keep everything in order, right? He is a historian. It's much more linear than some of the others. He's got all these time references. And just in those couple of verses I read, there are three time references, right? Verse 23 says, when this time of service was completed. Verse 24 says, you know, after for five months. Then verse 25, she says, in these days, he has shown my favor The Lord really does have time that he's working sovereign over, in, and around, right? The Lord who is above all things, through all things, in all things. The Lord really does have a timing. And sometimes for us to really remember that waiting patiently is not wasting time, the main thing we need to know is this. We need to trust in the Lord's timing. We need to trust in the Lord's timing. And Elizabeth recognizes here that the Lord's timing for me in my story and this prayer has been fulfilled. And I think for some of us, we have parts of our own stories, places where we're waiting and we're struggling. We're really struggling to surrender to the Lord's timing and the Lord's answer to be open-handed with that. Psalm 27, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Friends, these are reassuring words. We will see goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Some of what we want and how we want it may not be fulfilled in this part of our lives before we meet Jesus. There may be things we continue to wait for, but we can trust 
that God is moving, God is at work, God sees, hears, and knows, just like he did for Elizabeth and Zechariah, just like he knew for his people Israel. It says in verse 57, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. Don't you always just look at everybody else's life and go, the Lord's timing was perfect in that. It's easy to do it for someone else, isn't it? The Lord, I can see how God's timing is perfect in your life. We're the one, when we're the one sitting in that place of waiting, it's very difficult to surrender timing. And so I think for some of us, maybe it is a relationship, someone to share your life with. Maybe that's something you're waiting for. Maybe it's to reconcile a relationship that's been broken. Maybe it's about a prodigal child that you want to return to you and to the Lord. Maybe it's a dream in your life that you've been waiting on. Maybe it's a healing, whether that's emotional or physical, that you've been struggling to have hope in. Friends, we want to be in this place where we surrender to the Lord's timing. We trust the Lord because he is good and he is for you. He sees you, he knows you, and he doesn't forget you. It says in verse 59, on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. So you have to imagine this is the religious leaders of her community. They're here to do this sacred rite, which was the sign of their covenant. This was a big deal. Typically, the mother would have been quiet. And so she says, no, he's to be called John. And they say to her, there is no one among your relatives who have that, has that name. So they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. So there's a whole crowd here again to witness what's going on, to see that suddenly now the father who had been mute for all these months can speak and he's filled with voice to praise the Lord. They see. And if you look in these verses, it tells us things like they were astonished, they were in awe, they were filled with wonder they see that even though what they've been waiting for in terms of a Messiah and a Savior, it hasn't come to fulfillment yet, they see that God is at work. There's something amazing going on. And so for us, while we're in the place of waiting, we want to be people who renew our awe in the Almighty God of the Bible. We want to be people who renew our awe in the almighty God of the Bible. We need to be consistently going back to stories like this and his word all the time to see that our God is amazing. Our God is the one who can truly say, is anything impossible for me? Is anything impossible for me? Even in our waiting, this is the God that we see in scripture. So church, we need to have a practice of being constantly in God's word so that we renew that awe for the almighty God so that we remember that we can be persistent and we can be patient because our God is amazing and nothing is impossible for him. It says in verse 67, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So we move from Gabriel as the messenger, now to Zechariah as the messenger, filled with the Spirit. He speaks, inspired by God, and he says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, hundreds of messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. 
being fulfilled. This is what God gives Zechariah insight into, that these are actually being fulfilled in their own days through the coming king. He says, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors. It's been a long time of waiting, centuries upon centuries. And to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. This horn of salvation, the root, the branch, the shoot that was going to spring up that we talked about yesterday, here he is coming and Zechariah gets to be a messenger of Christmas. They receive this promise of God's great mercy. It tells us then that he turns from prophesying these words to the people to his own child. He speaks a prophetic blessing over his own child, John. He says, you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you are to go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, which, like the rising sun, will come to us from heaven. Remember, a theme of Advent Advent is this reality of moving from darkness to light, right? And even as we, believers in Christ, are transferred from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light, this is the meaning of the coming of Jesus says to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. There's a promise here for their continued waiting. We wait patiently. We're not wasting time. We can wait in peace because of our relationship with the Lord, knowing who he is. All these things that we've talked about this morning, the people receive promises of great mercy. And then it says in verse 80, the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So this morning, we're gonna be closing out this time in this story, but I just wanna encourage you church, as we sit in these Advent weeks, the weeks of expectancy and longing and waiting for our King, who came on Christmas, who comes in us once but day by day, and who will come again. We want to be a people who really reflect that we don't wait, we don't waste time, and in the waiting, we can deepen our relationship not only with God, but with one another, as we encourage each other in the hard places of waiting that many people are in. And this message that Zechariah brings to John, he announced, this is what your ministry is going to look like. This is what you get to do. You get to prepare the way for the Lord. And it, sure enough, we see a few chapters later that John the Baptist begins his public ministry, and he begins this baptism of repentance for sins. He tells the people, bear fruit in keeping with, re- in, with repentance. Why? Because you need to prepare your heart for the Lord to work there. He says, we're going to do this baptism of repentance for sins in the Jordan River. People are coming to him, and Jesus himself comes to John to be baptized. And John looks at him and says, this isn't right. You should be baptizing me, not the other way around. And Jesus says, this shall be done to fulfill all righteousness. Why? Because Jesus, the only sinless human who has ever lived, because he's also fully God, Jesus identifies with us as sinners and goes in that water and begins for us an example that he calls us to. One of the reasons why we do baptism is because Jesus tells us to. It's just simple obedience in that regard. He says, go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them, right? But we also do it to follow the example of Jesus, who going into the grave 
would cause sin to lose its power over all people by rising again in resurrection, right? Into new life, and this is the same experience we get to have. So we're about to begin a time of baptism. All the people who are being baptized are gonna come on up here, and we're gonna introduce them, and there's some over here and some over here. We're gonna introduce them. We have Julie Dawson and Ava, her daughter. Come on up and spread out. Here comes Julie and Ava. Jason and Melissa Livingston. Aaron Kingsley, come on out, Aaron. You get to be first. Oh no, you're not first. And Alyssa Markin, behind me. Come on up, you guys. We're just gonna kind of spread out. So this is Julie and Ava and Jason and Melissa and Aaron and Alyssa. Did I, Melissa, Alyssa, I did get it right. And we're so excited to be joining them today in the sacrament of baptism. This is a means of grace on the lives of these people. Not only do they do this out of obedience and love for the Lord, but it's considered a means of grace, meaning you will actually experience the presence and power of God in your life through this opportunity to say yes to Jesus. So we're so excited to be a part of this. And I think you were prepped for two simple questions based on the fact that Jesus lived a sinless life was crucified, died, and resurrected for the forgiveness of your sins, we're asking you, do you believe in him as your Lord and Savior today? Yes. We've got masks on, but we see a yes. And are you being baptized today to declare that you will follow him all the days of your lives? Yes, and amen. So, woo. I'm, I'm going to pray over them, and then as they come down and line up, we've invited family members and friends and rooted groups, come on up and be with them in the process. And so it's okay, we're going to make a good old mess of folks up here who are celebrating together, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, grateful that even through times when it feels like you're not there, times when we've been waiting, God, that we have this promise from you that is fulfilled in Jesus in all ways will be finally fulfilled when he returns again. And these sons and daughters of yours that stand before you this morning are committing to follow you with all of their days. And so, Lord, I just pray a blessing on them. I pray that they would experience your grace in exactly the way that they need in your life, in their lives today whether that be power, whether that be encouragement, or perhaps it's just a feeling of joy today. We're so thankful, God, that you interact with us in a personal way, and that each one of these is declaring their love and faith in you this morning. And we just trust you, God, with all of their lives as they say, I'm all in. So we love you, Lord. We ask that you would be glorified in what they do here this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people say, Amen. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I also want to add if anyone has been sitting here, as Pastor Heather said and has felt like the Holy Spirit is prompting you to take the step of believer's baptism, my prayer is that not a person here would begrudge that work of God in them. So if you want to be baptized this morning, it's not too late. You can come up and talk with me and we will baptize you today and we've got clothes for you to change into.
Stand up. Stand up.
Anybody else? Now's the time, friends. Amen. Amen. What a joy to celebrate the symbol of new life with you, church. And I have a benediction for you today from Isaiah about the hope of the Lord for those who wait. Church, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. Blessed are all who wait on him. Amen.